Okay, good evening, and thank you for joining us here at the Mechanics Institute. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our program, The Future of Privacy Security, for your eyes only, keeping your online information private and secure. Before we begin, I'd like to find out how many of you are new to the Mechanics Institute. Who's never been here before? A few. Wonderful. Welcome. First of all, we'd like to invite you to come on Wednesday at noon and get the free tour of our institute. Librarians will take you around our beautiful, vast general interest library, which is on the second and third floors. You'll get a tour of the chess club, which is an international chess club with various tournaments and classes going on throughout the year. And you'll get an introduction to our history. We are founded in 1854. And we currently have ongoing classes and courses, book clubs, writers groups, author programs, our Friday night cinema lit series, and of course our new programming that's going on, Think and Drink, a Transforming SF, and Mechanics Today. So we hope that you'll take the tour, that you'll join Mechanics Institute and become part of our ever-growing cultural family here on 57 Post Street. Also, we encourage you to join us after our program at the Donna Bar, which is in the downstairs retail space, and members receive a 10% discount on drinks. So come join us down there. Today, of course, privacy and security is one of the most important issues of our time. And we're very pleased to welcome our panel uh, for this discussion. So first, I'd like to introduce our moderator, uh, Lindsay Tanziger. Uh, Lindsay is a trustee of the Mechanics Institute. She works for Covington and Burlington LLP. Uh, there she helps national and multinational clients in a broad range of industries anticipate and effectively evaluate legal and reputational risks under federal and state data privacy and communication laws. And of course tonight we have a panel of attorneys from both the consumer's perspective and the corporate perspective. So please welcome our moderator and panel. Thank you. And I am very excited to be joined by such awesome panelists. Uh, Jeannie Sheehan from Groupon, Jacob Rogers from Wikimedia, Whitney Merrill from the Federal Trade Commission, and Nate Cardozo from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We all live and breathe privacy on a day-to-day -day basis. We're also all lawyers. So before you get up and run, I promise you we're gonna try to be really practical and hopefully you find us all interesting. So I wanted to kick us off, since this discussion is part of our Transforming San Francisco series, I wanted to begin by considering how important data really is to San Francisco's economy. The Bay Area's vibrant ecosystem of mobile app developers and retailers and financial services and life sciences companies and social media platforms and online services, all of them depend very heavily on consumer data. So starting with Jacob, what are some of the ways that Wikimedia collects and uses data from the people who visit your sites and services? Yeah, so um, the Wikimedia sites uh, collect a few different types of data. There's information that people give us. So uh, if you sign on to make an account, um, people give things like their email address. And that's useful because if you've ever forgotten your password, as I think almost all of us have, you can use that email address to uh, recover your password and actually be able to get onto the account. Um, there's also things like technical information that we get, um, things like what types of computers uh, people are using, what types of internet browsers they're using, and all of that types of information is really helpful for uh, the engineering teams at the foundation because they um, have to make sure that the sites run well no matter what sort of technology people are using and knowing uh, what people are doing and if they encounter problems, um, what technology they were using it helps them to develop and improve the sites. Great. And Jeannie, can you provide some examples of how Groupon uses data to improve the lives of Bay Area residents? I know you guys are 
all over the country, but you're here in San Francisco. So. Yes, I'm all over. Um, Groupon operates actually all over the world, um, but we um, certainly operate in the Bay Area, like many other places. And the value proposition with Groupon is actually sort of twofold. I think a lot of people think of the customer-facing application. If you've ever used the website or the mobile app, you've probably provided your information. But we also we consider ourselves having sort of two populations we work with. One is the customer side, but the other is actually the merchant side. So you can imagine, you know, if you, uh, you want to open a yoga studio, a Pilates studio in San Francisco, and you want to get customers in the door, you know, it can be very difficult to raise visibility. And so Groupon is a great opportunity for merchants to feature deals to consumers to say, you know, here we exist, here's a deal. It gets customers in the door. So it's customers sort of enjoy the discount, but the merchants really appreciate, you know, the increase in visibility. And so, you know, that's something we do for the Bay Area. It's something we actually do, for, you know, for around the world. And, I mean, Groupon actually began during an economic downturn in Chicago. And it's just sort of an understanding. I mean, there's so many businesses that have idle times where they don't have consumers. I mean, you can imagine if you're a massage studio and it's, you know, 10 a.m. on a Monday, that's not when many of us are getting our massages. And so it's, it's a really great opportunity for, on the merchant side, to offer discounts to get some people in the door so you don't have those idle times, those peaks and valleys in your, in your business. Um, and for consumers, of course, everyone you know, appreciates the discount. So it's really those two populations uh, that Groupon serves. That makes sense. And I, you see that in a lot, across a lot of different industries. Like that's kind of the value proposition of the ride-sharing services as well, right? Or when I post a picture of my daughter to, to a social media site to share with grandma and grandpa, all of that requires data and data collection. Um, Nate or Whitney, what comes to mind for you guys when you think about all the data that's being collected from consumers? Well, from our perspective, we look at it uh, both from the engineer side and from the civil libertarian side. So I work for EFF. We are a civil liberties organization dedicated to defending free speech and privacy in the digital world. And from our perspective, data is as much a liability as it is a benefit. Uh, when we look at engineers at Google, Facebook, you know, Apple, Microsoft, they see all of the data coming into their companies, coming from you to them, as a way of learning more about you in order, essentially, to sell you ads. From our perspective, the question isn't what they're going to do with the data, because what Google or Facebook does with the data is essentially their business. Our question is, what else is going to happen with the data? Is it going to get out? You know, are your browsing habits going to be plastered all over WikiLeaks next week? <laughs> or is the government going to come get it? You know, is the Trump administration going to come to Facebook and say, I want behavioral profiles of every Muslim in America? Um, and if the data exists, if the data is stored in a way that can be uh, tied back to the individual, and it's very hard to store data in a way that can't be tied back to the individual, who else? is going to want it. What else are they going to do with it? And are there still ways of doing business, uh, of getting the, the engineering value that you need out of the data without providing those unintended uh, benefits to people who you really don't want to be giving benefit to? Um, so I work for the Federal Trade Commission, which is a over 100-year-old federal agency that does consumer protection. We protect consumers from unfair and deceptive practices. I also am required to say that the views here are my own and do not represent the FTC or any one commissioner. Um, that being said, what do you know? I think about data. What, how does the FTC kind of think about data? And it's primarily from the consumer's point of view. What does the consumer know about the data being collected about them? Do they understand how it's going to be used? Is that being disclosed to consumers? Are they aware? And do they have choice? And so FTC will often talk about notice and choice. And so you know, are you getting the choice to say, no, I don't want you to have my location data? Is the application developer or whoever is collecting the information letting you know it's happening? Um, and how good is that notice? Are they really aware? If you're putting it in mouse print and you have to w use a magnifying glass, that's not good enough. And so the FTC... Or light gray on a white background. Or, <laughs> yes, light gray on a white background. And so... 
you know, the FTC, you know, has a very broad authority to do advertising cases where the agency that does identity theft, we also uh, fight robocalls. So there's a lot of different stuff that can be talked about regarding data, but in the privacy and data security space, the FTC has been doing it for about 30 years. Um, they've been talking about privacy before a lot of people because, you know, identity theft was a real problem and um, consumers were upset and complaining. And when you mentioned privacy and data security, what do, what do you mean by privacy? What does that, what does that mean to you? So privacy to me, wow, that's a deep <laughs> question. Um, <laughs> Privacy's dead. <laughs> I'm so you, you know it's it's having the choice at least for me to keep secret information um, that is personal to me. Um, the PII personal personal personally identifiable information to the FTC is any piece of data that can be tied back to an individual. Um, so a social security number, a phone number. Um, an IP address, a MAC address on your computer. Um, and so it can be a very broad thing what you know, is encompassed in what's considered private information. But yeah. what is privacy is a hard question. <laughs> oh, for those yeah. who may not know, the, um, the IP address and the MAC address are the technical numbers associated with your computer when you're browsing the internet or going to particular websites. So they are almost always automatically collected by um, websites that you visit but are often not publicly shown, but they are things that people have and that can be used in various ways. For example, um, there's websites where you can just type in an IP address and it will give you an approximate geographical location of where the person is uh, because they are associated with, if not a particular house, at least a particular area. Do any of you have other definitions of privacy? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so privacy is very difficult, right? Because there, there, we mean different things by the word privacy depending on the context um, that we say it. So as Whitney said, sometimes we mean the ability to keep secret things that we want to keep secret. Other times we mean the ability to control the audience for the information that we're disseminating. We're not necessarily keeping things secret, but we want to control who's able to see. Other times we just mean seclusion. By privacy we just mean the, the ability to be left alone. Um, you know, when, when I close my door in a hotel room and say, privacy please, I'm not, that, that's not necessarily because I want to keep secret what I'm doing inside the room, it might be, but it might just be that I just don't want to be disturbed. Uh, and, and all of those meanings uh, have value in the information era. Um, and so I, in, in my practice at least, uh, I don't describe myself as a privacy lawyer, and I try desperately not to use the term privacy um, because it, 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 the, the English word has so many different definitions, and there is no legal definition of privacy. Uh, so I try desperately not to use it. Um, I'm not a certified privacy. What, what's the term? The CIP. Certified Information <laughs> Privacy Professional. Right. Okay. I'm not one of those. Uh, so I, I don't have to subscribe to, to a, a particular definition, and I try and try not to. Yeah, I mean, I think I would add to that, you know, from the corporate perspective, I mean, a couple things. I think privacy, I mean, one thing, I think it's very jurisdictional. I think that means one thing in the U.S., it's sort of in popular understanding versus, you know, in the EU, it's a very different concept. I would say that... Um, in the EU, for example, they have much more of a conservative interpretation of what is privacy and the protections that should um, surround it. I think the other thing that I would add is I think it's a lot of times helpful to contrast, at least from my perspective, privacy versus security. A lot of times from a corporate perspective, we talk about privacy, and that's more of a consumer-facing sort of compliance protection standpoint. Um, in terms of security, though, that's really around how you safeguard and protect data. So at Groupon, for example, I wear both hats. You know, some companies will have privacy lawyers, they will have security lawyers. I end up wearing both hats where I'm, I'm sort of, you know, making sure that we're doing everything to comply with, you know, various FTC decisions, but also, I mean, Every company is constantly under attack if you have personal information. There are hackers that data has value on the black market. And so, you know, one of my closest relationships at Groupon is our head of information security. Um, and that's just, you know, making sure that we take steps to, to protect uh, the information. So it's very different roles and hats that I have. And not every company does it that way, but that's how we do it. Yeah, I would, I would add on to that. I think that 
like when we think about privacy usually in, in the sort of, again, uh, company perspective, a lot of that is about your ability as a, an individual to sort of curate what's out there, what information you show to other people or don't show to other people, things like some places you want to share your political beliefs and other places you, you don't, and keeping those separate and distinct. Um, whereas security is like, yeah, we, we try to make sure that if we have something at all, um, we're telling you how it's being used and it's not able to be used in any other way or be taken by anyone else without us knowing about it. Uh, at the, you know, sometimes it's like, you, you do the best you can and mistakes still happen, I think. Um, there's no company at the moment that is completely immune from all possible types of hacking. But even if you don't make any mistakes. Yeah, even if you make no mistakes whatsoever, like just the rate of change of technology is such that no one is immune to that. But we try to do the best efforts that we can to make sure that information that we have is stored safely and securely. A, a corollary to that is if anyone ever pitches you a product and they describe it as unhackable, run screaming. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> So Jeannie, when Groupon thinks about privacy and security, does it consider it to be a legal issue or a moral issue or a reputational issue or a political issue or all of the above? I feel like this is when I have to make the same caveat that I'm speaking for myself and not Groupon. <laughs> but I would say my role at Groupon, um, I certainly think it, of it as all of those things. You know, we're at a time, and I think this is going to be true for quite some time, where the technology is moving so much faster than the law can, and that is absolutely a global phenomenon. So, you know, when my engineers come to me and they say, you know, we want to roll out X product, you know, there are certain situations where there's a law I can look to that's on the books, and there are very clear answers in terms of the kinds of notice and choice and, and things like that we should provide. Um, for every situation like that, there are plenty of situations where there really is no law that says what we can or cannot do. And so, you know, a lot of times I go back to, I'm a customer myself. And I also know that one of Groupon's most important assets, actually two things, one is the data itself, and two is customer trust. So if we do something to compromise customer trust, then I'm not doing my job very well. And so, and it is sort of interesting because there, and I'm sure every company faces this, there's a huge sort of generational component, I feel like, in terms of how you view privacy and security. Um, you know, I feel like a lot of the engineers I work with are about 22 years old, so like, why not everything be transparent and open and, you know, yay, you know, flow of information. And so there are a lot of times that I'm just sort of, you know, broadening the conversation to say we really need to think about you know the long-term effects of if this data is out there or you know taking steps to minimize the information we have i mean with an eye towards it's difficult if not impossible for any company to make information 100 percent secure you know i'd rather be in a situation where we're not gathering information to begin with and so i think you know a lot of it is that's why i'm here even though our corporate headquarters are in chicago because this is where the engineers are and so I can be on the ground talking to them, you know, talking to them not only what the law is, but, you know, what we think it should be and, and, and really thinking about, because it is a moral question for all of the reasons that Nate describes. You know, I mean, I'm well aware that a government can come knocking on our door asking for location information of our customers or things like that. And so we pretty much, it's now only for the first time, you know, in the EU, for example, they're really starting to... Um, think about having very strict, not think about going to have very strict fines, up to 4% of a company's global revenue. It's called the General Data Protection Regulation. And that goes into effect next year. And that is pretty much one of the first time that privacy by design, this concept of thinking about privacy and building it in from the inception of a product is actually being legally required. But certainly, you know, now that's something we're absolutely thinking about in terms of our company's culture. Yeah, I, I like to think of it as um, helping companies be able to use the information responsibly without being too creepy. <laughs> it's the creep factor test. Exactly. <laughs> so some of the people in the, in the room with us tonight or on Facebook Live are engineers and entrepreneurs and developers. And for them, uh, I want to explore the idea that you mentioned of privacy by design and security by design. Uh, maybe, Whitney, I know you guys at the Federal Trade Commission have worked on this idea a bit. Um, do you want to unpack those concepts? Sure. Um, so privacy by design, um, or the FTC also has to start with security, means to create and develop your product, what you're building, with 
privacy and data security in mind first. Because the problem is, is you build a, this really awesome app and you go from just your friends using it to a million people using it and now you have to try to implement security and privacy features. It's a lot harder to do that moving backwards. And along that way, you may have been hacked, you may have been leaking data, um, you know, other bad things could have happened along the way, but if you're taking it into account from the very beginning, there's a smaller chance or risk that you know, user data might be used improperly. Um, and, and also, it, it just sets a good culture for a company or organ, organization to constantly be doing privacy trainings or talk about security so that as they grow and change, you know, not every developer has administrative access and access to all the user data as they grow from you know five people in a garage to you know a thousand people across the world and so the idea is you need to build in these things from the beginning um, to, to make everything just a little bit easier later on um, and the FTC looks at security and privacy from a reasonableness standpoint which means we ask for a reasonable level of security and so what's reasonable is this big gray area. Like this is where the lawyers have to <laughs> say to uh, the engineers that ask, you know, point to me to that law of why I have to do this. I imagine the problem they, they face is, well, like it has to be reasonable. Well, what's reasonable? And really it's a standard that takes into the account the size of the company, what kind of data they're collecting, uh, what type of service, who are the users, and compiling it all together to say, you know, what's reasonable? Because what we expect of Google or Facebook is very different than what we expect of a startup that is just trying to, you know, get off the ground. Can I give a concrete example of privacy by design? That was my next okay. question. So when I set my calendar reminder uh, to come to this event tonight, I put in the location as 57 Post Street, and I put the time as 6 o'clock because that's what time uh, they said that I had to be here. and for the reminder, I said, remind me when it's time to leave. There are two ways, uh, two, two ways that are easy to think about that a, a cell phone provider or a, you know, the, the provider of the operating system on this phone can do that. The first is uh, I put in 57 Post Street, my phone knows where I am, uh, the phone can download traffic information and find out the route and figure out how long uh, it's gonna take me to get there and pop up a reminder. Uh, my office is in the Tenderloin and it takes about 16 minutes. So pop up a reminder 16 minutes before six o'clock. The other way it can do it is it can transmit my calendar entry to a central server with the location and that, uh, that calculation can be performed on the server. And it just pops me a, a push notification when it's time to leave. Uh, Apple does it the former way. Uh, my phone actually knows where I need to be. My phone downloads the traffic information and my phone tells me. And it doesn't tell anyone else. Android does it the second way that I described. Android tells Google where I need to be and when I need to be there. Google does the calculation and returns me the answer. Uh, one of those is privacy by design. The other one is not. Aren't there trade-offs, though, in those two approaches? I mean, there's pros and cons in all respects. Like, you know, there's limited battery power, sure. server space. Sure. Uh, the, the way that Google does it uh, is less expensive from the consumer's perspective. It requires less hardware on the consumer end. It requires less software on the consumer end. It requires less storage on the consumer end. And it requires less bandwidth between the, uh, the endpoint device and the server. Um, the other thing is that the Google method of doing it provides Google with a ton of information which is valuable to them. Google makes their money not on selling Android but on selling ads. Apple makes its money based on selling me this, right? Apple doesn't sell ads, they sell me physical things that I put in my pocket. Um, and one of those business models is compatible with uh, with the on-device calculation and the other's not. Um, the, the end result is exactly the same. I get a push notification when it's time to leave. Both push notifications would happen at exactly the same time. 
Yeah, I want to comment on that. I mean, that's something that I face in my job a lot because a lot of what I do is also effectively product advising. Um, privacy, a lot of privacy and security lawyers end up doing that. And so it's, it is interesting because this concept of privacy by design isn't even about just what your company is doing. You know, when I'm rendering advice, if we want to give notice to our customers, there's a very different user experience on Apple versus Android. It's different in different countries. It's different if you're on a website. And so I have to sort of factor all of that in. So it is amazing. I mean, there will be times we're rolling out a product and privacy by design means accounting for the operating system, whether you're on your phone, whether you're on your computer, what country you're in. So we can have one question and have 20 different sets of advice, depending on the kind of device you are, where you are, and sort of in incorporating all of that in. And so I, I think privacy by design, and the other comment I would add to that is, is it's not just at one point in time. I mean, because this space is evolving so rapidly. We could have come to one opinion two years ago. And right now, you know, the privacy and security landscape is changing so rapidly that it is sort of, it's, it's building into company culture checkpoints to say, okay, this is, you know, the decision we came to a year ago. Um, you know, now we need to evaluate it again, you know, every time we're having an update that we roll out to, you know, an iPhone, you know, thinking about whether the law has changed. And so that's a conversation I'm always having with engineers, you know, keep in mind, I mean, you know, Apple has terms, Android has terms, there's a lot of things to keep in mind um, when safeguarding consumer privacy. Yeah, I think the, the, cult, the company culture point is a really important one because there's, there's been a belief for a long time by people that were you know, building uh, applications and building software that if they just sort of built something, they could then sort of figure out what they needed to do with it and look at all the data that they had and figure out how to make it better. And there needs to be, and there is right now, a change in that thinking where instead you have to say at the very start of a process of creating something, what is the information that we need? Like, what data do we need to actually do this? And how can we do it without getting anything that is extraneous or irrelevant? And sometimes people are still a little bit resentful of being asked that question because they're like, well, let me build the thing first and then we'll you know, figure out what it is that we actually need. Um, but I think that there's much more of an emphasis now, especially on trying to figure that out up front, understanding, you know, do I need to like, do I need to know where the person is or do I need to also know where they're going, for example, to uh, make my product work and doing the minimum amount so that you're not taking uh, information from and about people that you don't need to? I want to build on that because I work with a lot of companies that are at the cutting edge of artificial intelligence and Internet of Things, which are hugely data intensive types of technologies. You know, if you're trying to predict what somebody's saying or what the answers to their questions might be, you might not be able to limit the amount of data. You might need to collect all of the data. So can you, do you have any thoughts on, like, is there a tension between the data minimization principles that you just mentioned and these types of new technologies that are really, really need the data? They have legitimate purposes for the data. So I, I, I don't want to call it a tension. I mean, I think you're right that, you know, when you're trying to minimize things and you're not sure what you need, there's maybe a tension in figuring that out. But... I think that they can be done in harmony. So rather than be in tension, the idea is somebody who's building something, even if it is a, um, you know, AI system that is trying to predict user behavior to help you know, protect users, or to, for example, on, on um, Wikipedia, there's some AI that helps identify articles that need uh, improvement and more work, and then point those out to the, the volunteer editors that are working on the projects. Um, that looks at a lot of different data to determine the quality of an article, but much of that data is not private data. And I think as that feature was being built, there were conversations with the engineers about what information they really needed to be able to do a good job with that. And so, you know, sometimes the answer is we're not sure, and it can make sense in that context to err a little bit on the side of making sure the thing works. Um, but it's still good to have that conversation. So I don't think they have to be so much be intention as you just have to think about it on the front end. I would add to that too, I think one thing that's really changing is in the world of big data, I think for a long time everyone understands, so the common understanding is that big data is cheap. It's cheap just to just sort of gather everything and keep it forever and I think that that thinking is really changing. It's actually, as it turns out, quite expensive um, to have these various cloud providers and especially and from a legal perspective, you know, I can't really make it a sentence without using the word liability. <laughs> of course it's a liability um, to have, you know, this information sort of out there and so I think that's something that's really changing. I mean, one thing I heard last week that I really liked is we're kind of shifting from this world of big data to accurate data. It is not helpful to have stale information on your customers. 
and the reality is, is you know, customer preferences and taste, um, you know, storing that information and definitely, you know, with you know, Amazon Web Services is really expensive. Um, you hope that there's safeguarding information, but unfortunately, you know, no company can sort of protect it indefinitely. So I think. You know, in terms of the world of big data, I think that there's going to be a, a, a big shift, I think, for a lot of companies and how they think about, you know, how long they keep data. We need to it is them. very common for developers and even us as individuals to hoard data. Like, digital lives, it's very easy. Now I never toss anything on my computer. I just transfer files because I get a new computer and there's more space for me to fill it up. And so I have stuff going all the way back from high school. And I think developers and... Uh, you know, people who are collecting data kind of think the same way. Well, we're in a new stage of our product. Let's just collect and figure out what we'll do with it later. The problem there are two things. One, are you letting people know you're actually collecting that data? Do they know it's happening? Um, even if you aren't using it, if you tell consumers you're not going to use that data in a particular person purpose and you change your mind, can you do that? Probably not if you said you weren't going to do it before. Um, and so where a lot of the problems, for example, the FTC had a case against a smart television called uh, made by Vizio and it was collecting the viewing habits of um, everyone who purchased the television and giving it back and then providing that information to marketing companies. And consumers were completely unaware that this was happening. And the FTC, FTC said, you know, you cannot do this. This is not something that, um, you know, you need to let consumers know that this is happening. And so, you know, in one sense, you know, you could end up buying a product that says, we're going to collect all this information about you and you have to cons consent to use it. And that's kind of the model we're in right now. Um, but it's nice to hear that companies are moving away where they're saying maybe we don't need everything we don't want to seem creepy it's actually becoming competitive to be a privacy conscious company a security conscious company and so that that competition space is really helpful in you know advocating for you know your choice to choose what's happening with your data great so for those of us who are not engineers or entrepreneurs all of us are consumers so this question is open to all of you. What are some really simple and practical steps that everyone in the room or online can take to help protect the privacy and security of their information? Oh, okay. So, <laughs> Do we no. have an extra like two hours? <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to suggest one thing. And I, I don't even do this as well as I should, but everyone should do this. Don't reuse passwords yeah. on anything. Every single password that you have needs to be different, period. No exceptions. Do you recommend a password manager? Uh, if that helps you, use a password manager, absolutely. And I, don't, I don't recommend any specific one. Use one that works for you. Do you want to describe what a password manager is? Sure. A password manager is a piece of software that you have on your phone or on your computer or both uh, that helps that, that you, there's, you have one master password for. Uh, you type in your master password and it remembers your Groupon password or your Wikipedia password for you. Um, and it can sometimes generate them for and you. And it can generate you know, a 35-digit random letter number combination that you could never remember uh, by yourself, but it remembers it and it types it in for you. Um, password managers are uh, an absolute net positive. Use them. But even if you don't use them, just don't reuse passwords from site to site. I, do you mean site to site, or do you mean from time to time? Uh, from, I mean from site to site. Don't use the same password on Facebook that you do on Gmail, or on Groupon, or on your computer itself. Do you want to briefly explain why? Uh, I don't know. Someone else want to explain? Oh, that? so <laughs> one, of the, one of the big things that happens with a data breach, so you'll hear about Dropbox hacked, uh, what's another? Tar big? Target. Target. Yeah, target but Target didn't necessarily have passwords. It was credit card info. Yeah. Oh, Yahoo. Yeah. Yahoo. Yahoo. Yeah. Yahoo's a great example. Um, companies don't always store the passwords in a secure manner. Uh, or the passwords are somehow breached in plain text. There, there are multiple ways it can happen. But what happens is hackers will get this information, they'll find the username and the password, and then they'll try it on all different services. 
They'll just keep trying it. They'll say, oh, if you use this on Yahoo, are you using it on Gmail? Are you using it for Chase Bank? Are you using it for Bank of America? And they're going to test it until they get in. And now they're going down to like more serious systems. So you think, oh, Yahoo was hacked. I never used that account anyways. Uh, if you use that username and password anywhere else across, you know, or at least that password, but they'll guess. I mean, they, they play games where they'll you know, add a digit with scripting, it can be very sophisticated. So the best thing is just to have very different passwords. I'm a big fan of password managers. Um, even people, you know, in the tech community will rag on the books where you write all your passwords down. The chances of you getting a break in at home where someone <laughs> steals your password book or is in a safe is like much less. But there are amazing digital password managers that like do the work for you. Um, and I think I have 250 unique services and passwords. I don't know how many of you like will log in and it will say, you already have an account. And you're like, I don't know when I did that, <laughs> shoot. And I'll look in my password manager and there it will be. Um, and some password managers have audits where they'll tell you if that system or that uh, service was hacked. And so I think that's a really, really great, like just don't use, you, you know, if you're going to use unique passwords, like a password manager is a great next step. But the other thing I have to say is really scrutinize, um, as, as my answer of how you can be more secure, the emails and the phone calls you get. Um, how many people have gotten a phone call from the IRS? Uh, like, we're going to come arrest you. I illegitimate. Uh, <laughs> there, probably, there are probably no legitimate ones. Um, but the reality is, Think hard about it. They're scary, right? And the emails are scary. You know, look at the web address it's sending you to. Why is somebody sending you a PDF out of nowhere? Just like be critical about it and think, this is odd. And if something is going off in your head, like maybe don't give that personal information. But government agencies are never going to ask for passwords or usernames on law, uh, over yeah. the phone. Companies too. Companies too. Yeah, no, no one will like contact you out of the blue and ask for your password or your login info. The IRS. Well, no, plenty of people will, well, and they're all bad guys. Yeah, <laughs> but no one, no one <laughs> legit will do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, but on top of that, with, with the IRS, they'll send you to a government website, irs.gov slash payments, I think it is, to make a payment to them if you owe them money. Um, so just, you know, spread that around to just be, like, you know, be critical because it's, in this day and age, the attempts to fish that information from you are getting really good. And if you just say, you can hover your mouse over a link and see, does that link look weird, unfamiliar to you? Type it in yourself. Log, you know, if Bank of America's like, oh, there's something wrong with your account, type in your password. Go, you know what, I'll go to Bank of America on my own. Or like, I'll call the Bank of America number I know or is on the back of my card. And so that type. Can I ask a question about the password managers? Just to, so do they use cookies? How do they remember all the passwords? Oh, they're a program. So you, you download it onto your own computer, and then you, that program is like generating passwords for you, and it has its own so master password. Cookies and user password. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But the problem is Thank that you. some. We're going to ask you websites. to wait till the microphone comes to you for questions because we're recording. Okay, so why don't, let's take a break because so it seems like there's a couple of questions. So why don't, yeah, you want to. I think you had a question? Just wait, wait, just wait for the mic. Wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. Some websites are still requiring short passwords alphanumeric. I mean, we need to, maybe the <laughs> FTC, since the, that's the largest body in the world right now, maybe we should say, okay, you guys, come up to 26 and above characters, and, or maybe just open it up to 126. I don't care. Just make it a whole paragraph for all I care. And just let us type something. Let us make strong, strong passwords. Let us make it really strong. And like I use four different words from four different languages. And if you want to go to a dictionary uh, brute force, by all means. <laughs> yep. Yep. It's true. Hi, Luke Tessier. Thank you for the presentation tonight, and I really appreciate the work you're doing at the EFF. I think Thanks. it's critical. I, something I came across when I was doing side channel attacks on smart cards was this model that the payment card industry has of 
vendors shall not maintain certain information. They shall not maintain certain combinations of information. Although I've seen certain vendors violate that. But I'm wondering about your thoughts about having that be a sort of a more universal thing where anybody who's tracking information from customers like you shall not track location along with email address, along with phone number, or some way to use that as a model to defuzz the concept of good enough, reasonable, um, industry best practices, all of these things, weasel things where any good attorney could weasel out of it and say, oh, well, that's, that's too much. That's <laughs> so uh, strangely enough, if this were to be a government mandate, there'd be First Amendment problems with that. Uh, that's why the, 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 um, the credit card, the payment card information, that's all PCI. So that's industry self-regulation. That's not actually law. Um, it would be very difficult to do that consistent with the First Amendment if it were to be yeah. government. But a, I, a universal standard that says that if you want to be, you know, have the good, have the EFF, good housekeeping sealed, you need to do an <laughs> uh, I think that's a great idea. Consumer yeah. Reports is doing a, a privacy data security kind of seal of approval that they're working on. Um, it's out for comment right now, but they hope that when people buy a product, and it will have a consumer reports like seal of privacy conscious. You'll know kind of what that means. And so the industry is kind of starting to self-regulate. And actually yeah. back in the day, EFF did have a certification program, uh, which we spun off into its own organization. Uh, that organization is still around. They're very prominent. They're called Trust E. And uh, industry capture happened. And now the Trust E symbol is essentially meaningless. I would, I would also add to that that um, Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, that's a separate issue. I would also add to that. I mean, I think one challenge that every lawmaker faces. I mean, this has been sort of the global challenge. Is it's very difficult to be that specific um, because what ends up happening is the technology changes two seconds later. Yep. You know, yep. and so I mean, as the privacy team, we're always circulating. We have a, kind of like a creep contest to see sort of the latest and greatest and what's out there in the world in terms of what technology can do that just the average person wouldn't realize, you know, and so I think that is where I think, you know, overall the U.S. is probably behind what is happening in Europe because there the regulations are getting a lot more stringent. I mean, for everyone on this panel for the longest this time has known of the concept of privacy by design, but I feel like this is the first true mandate with, I mean, now companies are facing fines of up to 4% of their global revenue or, um, or 20 million euro, whichever is greater. And that's the first time, I mean, every company, I mean, I was just at a privacy conference last week, and I can tell you that's the general data protection regulation. But, you know, GDPR, I probably heard that 10,000 times because yep. it's waking companies up to say, okay, because there's now actually the stick. And just in the US, we just don't have quite the same equivalent to being certainly, you know, everything the FTC is doing, but it's, it's a lot more broad. Um, hi. Um, this is for the person from the FTC, I think. Um, I'm more afraid of predatory capitalism than I am of my government. And in these times, that's saying Thank a lot. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a company that I get an email from every day. Uh, the word life is in it. Um, and every day they have a threatening uh, subject line, like um, you may have a negative rating, uh, people may be writing bad things about you, things like that. Your data may be in, in danger. And I have not clicked on it once, even though I've you know, gotten them every day, because I understand that they're a protection racket. Um, what can I do, or what can anybody do about these, a company like this? So, um, one, I'm so sorry you're getting those types of emails. That's annoying and frustrating and uh, in our industry, we call it FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, which it is putting into you to sell you a product. And I hate that. Um, as far as what you can do, uh, you can personally send me that email for the government. I, I'm happy to give you my email because um, I'm always looking for cases. And um, also, we have a complaint assistant. It's ftccomplaintassistant.gov. Um, I swear people actually look at the complaints. We get weekly reports saying, you know, 
who who's the big complaint who are people complaining about what's hot what's new um, and it is something a way in which cases are generated um, and it's it's called consumer sentinel and it is used by multiple law enforcement agencies to kind of advocate for consumer protection so you can always you know email the or complain to the FTC and that goes for like if you get a robocall you can complain to them you get an email you can complain to FTC and the more you that's actually the best thing you can do because the more we hear uh, the better um, but you know personally I'm, I'm happy to, to hear about it thank you hi I'm I'm Peter Warfield from Library Users Association I'm glad to say we've worked with EFF to stop RFID radio frequency identification tags going into library books that's 12 years ago and again now in its planned version uh, the one thing that I'm glad to hear very much today is about the EU and the R word, which we seldom hear in these sorts of discussions here, and that is regulation, and I would also call it collective action. I think that the individual things that people can do are fine if you have the brains and the energy to keep up with it, and as you said, uh, things keep changing, so you've got to constantly be alert and aware. But I do think, I'm very glad to hear about what EU is doing. They, are, they have, as far as I know, always been much stricter and more aware of privacy issues, data crossing borders, and all kinds of things over many decades. And I think we should look to what they're doing and what we can do uh, in groups, uh, whether it's my group, EFF, uh, other groups, and through government regulation. We stopped RFID coming into our public library by going to the supervisors and make, getting them to refuse funding. But I think that regulations and predatory capitalism, all these sorts of things, would be greatly assisted by collective action that works on governmental keeping an eye on things and regulating things. I also think that there's a great need from people's ignorance well, I'd, I'd like to know what everybody thinks about that, uh, <laughs> whether they agree with that or have other ideas. I also think that other things that are valuable are educating people about the problems, giving examples of when things have gone wrong, and as I said again, collective. So I'd be interested if other folks have a different idea or co concept sure. of the value of it. So from the EFF perspective, our legislative and regulatory agenda in DC is damage control. That's it right now. Uh, in the states, our uh, regulatory and legislative agenda is quite broad. So we're, we're doing a lot in California, we're doing a lot in other states around the country. But on the federal level, uh, we are fighting back attacks rather than going on the offensive ourselves. Yeah. I would say something similar also from Wikimedia. The, the challenge we sometimes see as people are putting together regulations is they don't actually make people safer. Um, they will propose things that are just either completely unworkable and therefore, or if they are workable, they are extremely expensive. And so what you end up with is a regulation that looks like it's designed to help privacy, but actually will just lead to like the consolidation of big business and difficulty for other new people to come and compete. So we are trying to be careful and conscious of, the, of watching for that while still advocating for privacy best practices. And I think if regulation is well constructed, uh, then we would definitely support it. Yeah, I actually think, so section five of the Federal Trade Commission Act is the big authority that the Federal Trade Commission has in it. As Wendy mentioned, it prohibits unfair and deceptive practices. So you can't lie to consumers and you can't treat them poorly. And I actually think that broad scope allows the agency to actually react really well to changes in technology and deal with issues as they come rather than prescriptively tamping down really specific practices that are inevitably going to change right. I mean, in six months. Ten years ago we would have said it's a requirement that websites uh, store a hashed version of the password. Today that would be insane. Um, What's a hash? A hash is a cryptographic function that is supposedly irreversible. You can take 
Uh, my name, Nate Cardozo, run it through a hash function, come out with, a, with what looks like a random string. You can prove that the random string came from my name, but you can't take the random string and turn it back into my name until you get sufficient computing power. Uh, and we've now hit that until. So 10 years ago, we thought that that was a really great way of storing passwords. Today, it's uh, complete insanity to store passwords using a simple hash function. And MD5 had a crash. Have it. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah, this is also for Whitney of FTC regarding Ooh. the Vizio and the smart television and capturing data without consumer permission. Did that happen pre Trump? I would think so, but I hope I'm wrong. And how have things changed? Because I think Bose is starting to do that. There's always. So um, the FTC's makeup is five commissioners. It's a bipartisan commission that um, is three of the main party of the president, two of the um, other party. And I say other party because it has been two independents and three Republicans in the past. It has been three Democrats and two Republicans. So right now the commission is made up um, only of two people. We have our acting chairman, Olhausen. She was appointed by Obama, as well as Commissioner McSweeney, um, who is a Democrat. So Olhausen is the Republican. Um, as a bipartisan commission, um, you know, it's not much has changed in that sense. Um, they're both fighting for consumers and consumer rights. Um, each chairman has their own agenda um, and, and projects they like to work on and drive the industry forward. Um, acting Chairman Olhausen is really interested in uh, fraud and abuses towards small businesses as well as uh, things that have happened or t um, consumer issues involving uh, vet, veterans targeting veterans or elderly. And so sometimes, I mean, it's cons for what it's worth, the FTC protects consumers. You're never doing anything bad. It's great. Um, <laughs> so I have no, <laughs> you know, that's, that's my, my two cents. As younger generation are pushing more for more transparency, don't see the need of privacy, correct? Like you kind of mentioned, younger developer community. What are the implications for democracy as a whole? <laughs> as a whole. <laughs> Easy if question. We need, if we need transparency, does it matter? Uh, all right, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I think that, first of all, I'm not sure that that is an, an ongoing and ever-increasing trend. Um, I think we're actually seeing, for example, with the switch in the presidential administration, there's a lot of people who were all for like transparency and complete openness that are suddenly like, hey, I, I actually don't want all of this information known by the government. Um, so that may or may not actually be the way that the trend is going, and it could be more of a like waxing and waning kind of thing. Um, to the extent that there is a, a trend of people pushing for transparency, I think it is good in some places. So when you have transparency on the government side, when you have transparency from decision makers and transparency from businesses about you know, how they're using your data, notice of what they're doing with it, that allows um, just people in the world to make informed decisions. And I think that makes things better for the most part. Um, I, can't, like, I can't think of an example where it doesn't make things better. I just sort of wanted to uh, you know, put in that caveat there. But it generally makes things better. On the other hand, when you have individual people who are all this information about them is available, that does create a risk. And it creates a particular risk, I think, for activities that we normally think of as needing to be protected, but that become vulnerable when everybody has all this information about everyone. So for example, political advocacy is the kind of thing where you generally don't want it known by everyone, especially if you are advocating on a controversial topic or a controversial viewpoint. Um, but if the only people that are trying to keep things private are the uh, people engaging in political advocacy, then they are vulnerable in a way that they might not have been before. I'm sure Nate can say a lot more about that. Yeah, um, I'll actually, uh, I'll, I'll do what lawyers call fighting the hypo and I'll push back on your, on your premise. Um, I think young people, uh, have a much more sophisticated view of privacy than we do. Uh, young, if you ask someone, if you ask you know a, an average middle schooler, 
um, what their Snapchat or Facebook or Instagram privacy settings are, they will tell you in a way that you, you know, don't even have a concept of. And they have you know, lists, they, they know exactly who is going to see each of their posts. They know which posts their parents are gonna see and which posts their parents are not gonna see. Uh, and they're much better at it than we are. Um, so to, to say that, the, that, that young people today don't believe in privacy or, or believe in radical transparency, I think is a, that's, that's what they want you to think. And that's not right. Uh, they, they have a much more sophisticated view of privacy than we do. Although that being said, I mean, I think one of the reasons why Europe has such a different view on these issues is a historical perspective. Yeah. That I feel like there's a point that is certainly lacking in the U.S. I mean, you, you don't have to, you know, talk too long in a conversation with someone in Europe, and there's, I mean, there are very clear reasons why some of these protections, just that thought process that's sort of behind that, that I feel like isn't necessarily in our cultural fabric the same way. Although I, I to push back on that a little bit, I, I think that's right as far as the law goes, but then like, there's a number of European countries that have the the highest number of closed circuit television cameras on the streets. Yeah, so. Europe has the weird uh, dichotomy where Europeans distrust corporations at a, exactly. at a visceral level and for some reason trust their government. And in the United States, for some reason, we distrust our government, but yet we trust corporations. Um, neither yeah. of those perspectives is correct at all. But. I think I'd also add too, I mean, there's, you know, the comment about is, is about, the question is about transparency, but I think a lot of times in the U.S. there is this huge focus on transparency. I'd say it's necessarily, but certainly not sufficient. I mean, I think now more than ever, if we're talking about, you know, what's important for our democracy, you know, accuracy of data. It mm -hmm. has been so fascinating to watch that play out on the national stage of how easy it is to sort of manipulate data. And so we all have these sort of um, digital profiles, you know, of who we are and our digital existences. And it's, it's interesting to see how that's, you know, played out over the last year in terms of the impact on the democracy. So I think it's, I, I think there's so many different concepts that come into play that I, mean, I think transparency is important. But it is interesting, you know, even you know, working with customers, I mean, people say they want more transparency. That's why, I mean, there's so much criticism of companies for having long privacy policies. First of all, it's legally required. Um, and it is an attempt to sort of, I mean, because you're sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't. I can tell you doing my job, we want to make sure we have everything in there. Because the last thing we want to be accused of is saying we weren't transparent about what we're doing. So you end up having long descriptions of this is exactly what we're doing. But then there's sort of the eyes, you know, how practical is that? And so I think it's, it's, it's a really interesting time because I think it's, and that's where it, it's a, it was a great question earlier in terms of, you know, is the law enough? And I would say, you know, the answer is certainly no. I mean, there's, you know, the ethics questions and sort of philosophical questions. And so I think that's probably one of the, I mean, maybe the only benefit of the current time that we're in is these conversations are happening on the national stage in, I think, an incredibly important way. Question in the back. Thank everybody for very fascinating discussions. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, in, I live in another coast half the year, and an elderly member of the family was um, targeted through a, a scheme out of Jamaica. Um, it got to be very involved. They were going after elderly people, um, having to do with you know sweepstakes. And um, <laughs> I wrote to everybody I could think of in New York City and around the country, and the only thing that we could ultimately do was change our phone number because, um, you know, there, it, it just became a little bizarre because there were certain rules in New York where you couldn't block another country. And then this sort of leads into other stuff, um, you know, the subject of like Interpol. Um, what can you do when you're, you know, targeted, for instance, um, on your computer by an outfit in the Philippines, in Africa, these complicated international criminal syndicates that com constantly fish people's emails, and then once you step into that sand trap black hole, you know three years, two years, five years down the line, bang, you're going to be targeted again. You know, so... Um, um, what I'm wondering is why, for example, in San Francisco, we do not have an a, um, internet fraud department, for example. I've been, you know, faced this problem several times, getting stepped into various black holes. Um, and it's sort of astonishing why we don't have something like that in Northern California when you do have a complaint of this kind, when you haven't actually suffered a financial loss, but you have 
um, somebody that's attacked you for your identity theft, etc. They've almost gotten money, but not quite. Um, you know, the local police force will say, you, you don't, um, uh, you haven't made a, had a loss. And anyway, it becomes this very complicated issue where you can't get um, any help. Thanks. Yeah, so Whitney, I know, I know you, the FTC deals a lot with identity theft. Do you want to give some tips there, how to avoid it, what to do? Yeah, so being targeted feels just the worst. And um, sometimes it feels like you, you can't escape it. One of the problems with identity theft and small crimes, even ransomware, um, where you'll download a virus and now it's taken over your computer, it's too small of a crime for local police to get involved or they say, oh, the criminals out in another country, nothing we can do. Whereas petty theft before, the police used to maybe do something. Um, and so the Federal Trade Commission, um, I mean, for the, the extent that we can, we work with um, countries, we, we travel to other countries and work with their local police to help them combat the um, crime that's happening coming from their country targeting U.S. citizens. So for a long time, the FTC was traveling to India, working heavily with the Indian government and the police there to kind of advocate and say, you know, let's talk about the call centers that are doing these illegal robocalls or IRS scams. And, and, and eventually, there, you know, the Indian government took, had a big sweep and took a lot of them down. And so it takes time. The unfortunate thing is from the consumer side, what you can do um, is complain to the FTC. Um, there is also ID, identitytheft.gov, um, which will walk you through the steps if you're um, targeted or you're a victim of identity theft and what to be aware of. The, the unfortunate thing is I just ignore every phone number that I don't know. Um, once you pick up, they know that you, someone is on the other line. So I just let it go to voicemail because I know the people who need to reach me will leave me a voicemail. And so I sadly screen a lot of my calls. Um, as far as like how you can stop from being targeted, they're just gonna throw it at you nonstop and you just have to unfortunately ignore it and report it. And, and you know, to the extent that the FTC can, you know, we do go after sweepstakes scams. We do go after IRS scams. Um, and, and the important thing is, you know, goes back to my previous comment, what's the thing that you can do to protect yourself? Scrutinize, think, go, this is weird, and just hang up on them. You know, I don't know what this email is, delete. Because if someone really wants to get in contact with you this day and age, they'll find a way. Like, yeah, I mean, we, we actually do have a pretty good resource here in San Francisco. The California Attorney General's Privacy Office up at 355 Golden Gate uh, is pretty good. Uh, they can only go after bad guys in California, but that's, that's just the limit of their jurisdiction. And we work with the California Attorneys General as well as um, the Attorneys General across the United States to, you know, see who are victims of fraud and scams and to, to protect them and to, you know, to try to stop those entities. Um, and that's one of the you know, initiatives and, and, and important missions that the current acting chairman is advocating for, which is like, let's, let's try to stop some of this stuff and make a special effort, especially those um, you know, targeting the elderly. I've got a couple questions in the back and then we'll move our way back to the front. Thank you. Uh, with regard to the uh, security of the content of password managers, I use LastPass. Uh, do you know whether they, the, that content is encrypted or otherwise protected from malware or somebody getting into your computer? Um, so you may have heard in the news about LastPass. I can't recommend any one particular password manager, but any password manager use uh, is good password manager like that it's going to make you more secure as far as whether or not they're encrypted to my knowledge they claim that they are I believe that uh, personally I personally believe that they are and that they are doing their best to use security best practices um, I think the incident that you may have heard of in the media um, was uh, security researchers had found some vulnerabilities in LastPass, this is very normal. All software has vulnerabilities. All software has bugs. Um, the company rapidly responded um, uh, and, and, and patched those vulnerabilities. So as a LastPass user, I, I mean, I personally wouldn't be, you know, I don't use LastPass, but I have friends who use LastPass, and I say, 
you know, you know, just, I, I think you're probably fine. Always keep your software up to date because if they're patching vulnerabilities, that's a way you can also make sure you're secure. I can also tell you what not to use. We were laughing because there's like a book on Amazon right now. Have you seen this? Where it's like a password manager so you can write down all of your passwords. And it literally says like, you know, password book on it. I'm like, this is wonderful. So just keep that right next to your computer so everyone has a Bible of every, you know, every password so for all of your... That's actually honestly, not that bad. Doing that would be, be way be better, better than yep. using the same password on every yeah. site. Yep. Way better. Because the chances that you're going to have your office broken into or your home broken into... It's less, less likely. But keep that thing secure. I work in an open office, so I don't know about that. <laughs> so, yeah, open office. Don't, you leave, know. don't leave it sitting out like on the, you know, on the table where it's like, here's how to get into everything. But you know, put, it, put it in a drawer, out. lock the drawer, and like, that's, way, yeah, that's way better than using the way same password better. in 30 places. Right. <laughs> it's a hierarchy. Question here. Um, so I'm curious about uh, your thoughts on... Uh, hackers coming from Russia, coming from China, uh, state-owned enter entities uh, that are intentionally trying to hack not just individuals but, say, the U.S. government. I, I've heard the Department of Defense has been hacked, the IRS has been hacked by foreigners, and I, I'm just curious as to what your collective take on uh, foreign hacking attempts not on, on the U.S. government and the integrity of our information uh, from a government standpoint is how safe is that? Mm. <laughs> I mean, if, even as like from the perspective of a company that, that cares a lot about these things and tries our, des our best to keep up with data security practices as much as possible, I think there's an understanding that if a significantly powerful foreign government decided to specifically turn its attention to, to any one company or person or, or group, they're probably going to get what they want and you can't really stop that. Um, but it's just sort of, you just sort of live in that world. And I don't think that's like, it's, I don't think that's the thing to be worried about because they're not going after everyone and everything and this is a matter of like being obscure enough or being not important enough for them to target. Like even within the US government, there's just a lot out there and they may make efforts on certain things and that may happen, but we just have to kind of keep improving, keep fixing uh, mistakes that are found and accept that the world is a, you know, a little yeah. bit imperfect, right? Like you can't actually stop everything. And from, uh, from an information security perspective, uh, a lot of times we don't we, we talk about making the cost of exploitation higher. So mm -hmm. you're never going to keep anything completely secure. You're never going to make anything unhackable. You can make it really expensive to hack a particular system um, or a particular company or a particular network. Uh, and so and and that's the best we're ever going to get, right? If the NSA wants into my phone, they're going to get into my phone, but they're probably going to have to spend a million bucks to do it. And that's, that's the world that I want to live in. Um, I, I want to I live in a world where, uh, I mean, I, I would love to live in a world where things are unhackable. That's a fantasy. I want to live in a world where things are really hard to hack. Um, and that's the goal that I think all of us on, at this table share. Yeah, I mean, I think on the unhackable piece, it's sort of interesting because it's, it's, it's going to be a long time before, if ever, before we ever get there. Because what's interesting is, to me, about some of these hacking attacks is how sophisticated they aren't. Yep. Because a lot of times, all it requires is the human element. I mean, phishing schemes. Mm -hmm. You know, you get an email from your boss, hey, send me X. Well, my boss just sent me an email. I'm going to respond. You know, raising awareness within organizations just because your boss sends you an email asking for the crown jewels that maybe your boss probably wouldn't send an email like that. You know, that, that's a huge challenge. And so it is sort of interesting because, you know, every company is spending more and more and more on information security. I mean, I, I notice every time I, I fly into SFO and, like, all of the billboards are sort of cybersecurity companies in this huge cottage industry. You know, it's I mean, a great industry to be in because every company is, you know, throwing so much money at it. But what's so interesting to me is you always have the human element. 
And so as long as that exists, you know, it's going to continue to be a challenge. And so I think it's just continuing to raise awareness, you know, and, and, and it, it's exactly what she was saying earlier in terms of just that gut test of, okay, I mean, because I get phishing emails quite often. It's just very bizarre. And there's, oh, it's always just like a smell test. Like, this is just a little off. You know, why am I getting this right now? And it's, but it is amazing how good they are. Scam emails too, really interestingly, if you ever, like, there are examples online, they are, have a lot of misspellings, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they do this on purpose because they don't want to be too successful. They can't handle the volume. So, you know, they're going to be off just a bit, um, and, but if they're trying to hack you, they're going to be really accurate. So there are two different types, right? You know, one type of scam, send me money. But I think now that security and privacy are, you know, talked about pretty regularly within organizations, it's okay to say to your boss, hey, I just got this email from you. Did you really send it? Like, pick yeah. up the phone and call and ask the person. Um, and, and if they're like, yeah, why are you asking? You're like, you know, just being extra secure. And I don't think anyone's going to go, oh, tis, 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 you've been, you know, extra secure. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's worth going that, you know, kind of extra step. Question here in the front. I want to ask about um, hospitals and the medical, uh, our medical information. Uh, there have been a lot of hospital hackings. Hospitals are renowned for having very poor um, security. So that troubles me, and you don't want that information out and about. But in addition, what about turning off people's pacemakers uh, and otherwise thwarting some of the medical things? I mean, how serious a problem is this, and how does it get controlled? Well, uh in, in theory, it's, it's a potentially very serious problem. Um, there have been proofs of concept uh, that you can remotely disable a pacemaker or remotely turn a pacemaker into something that will kill someone. Um, to my knowledge, we haven't seen any of those attacks in the wild. So it's, it's theoretical so far. Um, hopefully, we'll never move beyond theory. Uh, part of the problem is, as the Internet of Things becomes um, you know, as we put the internet on things which have never had the internet on them before, the engineers who build pacemakers, the engineers who build refrigerators, the engineers who build cars have never had to think about computer security. Uh, cars have had computer networks in them for 15 years, but they haven't been connected to anything, so security hasn't been something that, that car makers have had to worry about. All of a sudden, you put a, a modem, which is essentially what most cars have in them, and you put the car on the internet, uh, security becomes a huge problem, like all of a sudden. Pacemakers. Pacemakers have had computers in them essentially since they were built, uh, and they've had wireless communications in them for a very long time. Um, the problem is, it used to be that those wireless communications device had a range of about six inches, now they have a range of 300 feet. Uh, and that's very different. Um, so companies, in industries that have never had to think about computer security before, all of a sudden do. Um, and they're particularly bad at it. One of the things that I do in my practice is I counsel uh, security researchers who, who find vulnerabilities in these systems. Um, and a company like Microsoft or Apple or Google um, have dedicated pathways for reporting vulnerabilities. They're very good at it. Um, sometimes they'll even pay you money for reporting a vulnerability. A medical device company says, why are you hacking a pacemaker? And instead of connecting you with a security engineer, they connect you with an attorney who sends you a cease and desist letter. I um, mean, that's bad for everybody. That's bad for the, comp that for the medical device manufacturer, it's bad for the researcher, and it's terrible for the patient. Uh, so I, I think a, 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 shift, a, a shift in corporate culture in companies that have never had to think about these things before is, is what's necessary here. Although I think they're getting up to speed very quickly. I mean, yeah. to your point about uh, regulation, yeah. there... It's bad out there. <laughs> I, it's really bad. I mean, there's, there's whole regulatory proceedings on the safety I'm, of so connected cars. I'm part of cars. those multi-stakeholder, yeah. I will, I will say, too, especially with medical devices, it is a whole different world uh, for computer security than your phone. Right, your phone has a vulnerability, the software can be updated, a company can push that update. Um, you have a medical device in your body, um, what if it can't be updated? 
and there's a vulnerability out there. Um, how does the FDA that regulates medical devices handle that? This is a very, very hard question, and I know a lot of really smart people who have been in computer security for a long time who don't know what the right answer is. Voting. Because you get a vulnerability disclosed to the company, or someone discloses it publicly, and the company goes, we can't update it, we can't fix it, now what? Um, and how do you handle that? And so there are a lot of really hard questions with implanted medical devices that are just really special to that industry because you can't, how do you recall something in your body? Or, or embedded systems in general. So, um, you know, Teslas can receive software updates over the air, Fords can't. And you can, or you know, Jeeps cannot receive a software update over the air, but they can, you know, you can apply the brakes over the air. Um, and so those have to go into the dealership to get updated. Uh, which goes to privacy by design and security by design, which is you need to think about end of life products. What if your company ceases to exist? Does the product die? Um, what if the, the product needs to be updated? How does the consumer, how does the purchaser do that? Um, and so when you think about all these things when you're first developing your product, you will get to a point where like, you won't hit those troubles later on. Hi, um, two quick questions. One, going back to password managers, is Apple's keychain considered a password manager? Yeah. yeah. And, secure. And, and the second, is it true that um, mobile apps are intris intrinsically much uh, more hackable no. and less, um, so it doesn't matter if I'm using my Bank of America mobile app or a browser. Your Bank of America mobile app is probably more secure than the website, but that's yeah. only probably. I don't actually know the answer to that question. Um, there's nothing intrinsic about having, being it being mobile that makes it more or less hackable. Um, we, we, we talk about something called attack surface. The attack surface of a web browser is quite large because web browsers can do all sorts of things. They can do video, they can do audio, they can contact any domain that's out there by design, right? They have to because that's what you use a web browser for. The Bank of America mobile app can do one thing. It can contact Bank of America. So it's actually easier to secure that because it has we would say a smaller attack surface because it has fewer things that it has to do. Um, you know, if the security engineer in charge of that product sucks, the product is gonna suck. <laughs> two quick questions, quick. I've got two quick questions. I don't know about the answers. <clears throat> the first one is, it seems to me very difficult and I don't know how you do it, uh, how, do, how does anybody know when or if the terms of use have been violated? That's number one. And number two, I think there's a flip side of privacy and security, and that is censorship. So Facebook cuts out certain things. They don't like certain images. Biblio Commons, a catalog system at the public library, takes the liberty of from Canada, a Canadian company, simply cutting out comments that people want to put, up, put on books that they otherwise would be free to comment on. Search engines can leave out results if they feel like it, and that sort of thing. Um, so let me do the first question. There, there is a good way and a bad way to find out that uh, something has been uh, you know, hacked or somebody's violated your terms of use. The bad way is when they release it publicly and that's how you find out. Um, the good way is if you actually have um, you know, security engineers and you have technologies for monitoring your own network. So for example, um, let's say that somebody tried to hack a, a like, database of passwords for the, the Wikimedia Foundation. There's, um, we, we have several security staff and there is um, network monitoring. So if somebody had downloaded a really large amount from that server, because there, there is like an actual machine physically located somewhere, it's a, it's a computer server that has that database on it. Um, if that was downloaded in a large quantity, somebody on our security team would notice that and be able to tell us that that had happened and then we could investigate and figure out that maybe there had been some kind of breach and start you know, notifying people and letting them know they should change their passwords or uh, you know, something like that, right? So the idea that is that you have internal monitoring, you have security people that are actually paying attention to that and therefore can catch those problems as quickly as is possible if a vulnerability is found and exploited. 
The, the other thing is, I mean, traditionally the FTC, we generate cases in a whole different way. We, we bring and investigate our own cases against companies and individuals. Um, for example, with scams, it happens to you. You know it's happening. You're a scam. You complain to us. We hear about it. We can take action. If a terms of use is violated or a privacy policy is violated, they're collecting information that they said they weren't collecting or they're doing something that you know, a consumer may not recognize it. And so we rely on uh, researchers and people who spend time looking into this type of information to tell us and let us know, hey, um, I happen to be playing around with this app and it's collecting information it shouldn't. And so, you know, that's where news media reports, et cetera, can, can be really helpful, at least in our enforcement, to, to kind of look at where uh, terms of use or terms of service violation might be coming from. The censorship question, the answer is uh, a panel in and of itself. Yeah. <laughs> um. So I have a 36 part question. No, no, just kidding. <laughs> Two part question again. Um, so what is more important from the corporate standpoint? The first to market, grab the market share, or let's design a product that's good, secure, and let's be uh, honest about it, and no frills, and whoever comes first afterwards, okay, fine. And the second part is, will we ever have a HIPAA-style law or regulation for all companies, not just healthcare, but a HIPAA-style protection of data for all companies, not just healthcare. Thank you. Yeah, the second one is called the GDPR. It's going into effect in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> the general data protection. General data protection. The There's not States one in the United like States, that. although probably we're all going to have to comply with the GDPR anyway, more or less. Um, but it, it would be, it's possible for that to happen in the United States, but historically the U.S. has done it by type or by industry sector rather than having some kind of like general privacy regulation. So there'd have to be some kind of broad base of public support that would lead like the entire Congress and the president to decide that that was a law that they wanted to spend their time and effort getting into place. And, which, and there have been yeah. companies actually that have pushed for a broad based privacy framework in the US. Um, I when I first started my career, I was doing that work, but then Congress broke and yeah, yeah, we'd certainly love to see a situation where we didn't have 48 states. Yeah, we would certainly like to see a situation where we didn't have 48 states, you know, data breach notification exactly. laws to comply oh, with. Yeah. I would love a national great. standard, you know, in terms of, you know, that would make a lot more sense. And I mean, it is a good point. I mean, gen you know, the general data protection regulation, most companies with global operations are sort of evaluating because you, you can't have, you know, multiple products. And so ultimately we are, you know, looking to that for our sort of global operations. But I mean, to address your first question, I mean, I certainly can't speak for all of corporate America. You know, obviously we've seen examples of, of both. I mean, there are companies that speed to market before they stop and think about anything. I mean, Uber. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and so I think, you know, as a consumer, you know, one thing I look at, you know, Groupon is a company, we work with a ton of vendors. And so it's been very interesting. I think one of the most interesting things for me doing this job is I end up sort of doing you know, due diligence from the corporate perspective. Because there's a lot of really neat technologies right until you realize it is you know, four people sitting in the back of the garage, one of them probably getting high, and you're thinking about, we're going to give our crown jewels to them? You know, I don't think so. And so I, I think you know, we're at a time where I think companies are well aware that customer trust is incredibly important. And so I think... The companies that are, you know, sort of speed to market, maybe they win in the short term. But if you lose that customer confidence, that's, that's something I truly believe it's very difficult, if not impossible, to get back. Yeah. And I, would, I would add to that, I think that first part of that question is not really an internet-related thing or a privacy-related thing. It's a question about reputation. And it's, it's something that has always existed in, in business for, you know, human history, right? There are some people who are willing to try and take advantage of a situation and jump, jump in quickly and exploit it and not be careful. And there are other people who care more about their reputation and their reliability over a longer time. And I think we try uh, to have ways to distinguish that. So um, something like what um, Nate was talking about with trustee before they sort of lost meaning. 
um, where you know if you if you have um, some people who are like checking out, you know, is this company complying with best privacy pr practices? That is a way to know if something is good or not, and there are some people that are going to care about that. That was in reference to the white design, mm -hmm. privacy and white design. I mean, we do have an example, Fort Knox, and just here in our backyard, while well, it's the opposite, no one has technically escaped from Alcatraz, so if you put something inside, no one can take it out, so I guess no one can take it in, technically. So, I mean, yeah, there are things that are unhackable, but it's have to be designed that way. Well. You'd be surprised. Anything called unhackable is a challenge by hackers and security researchers to find a way. It would be expensive to hack, so they yes. would be Yes, exactly. Great. Lindsay, any other comments or No, questions? just thank you to the panel, and thank you for such incredible questions. Thank you. And I'd also like to give a special thank you to Lindsay Tonziger who is also a Mechanics Institute board member. So a special thanks to you and our esteemed panel. A wonderful conversation. Come back and keep it going.